Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, hooray. Now I need glasses. Nick was born in Kitwe, Zambia, and he began his marine career in 1980, working on tugs of a South African salvage company. His work has taken him all around the world, wrestling with vessels on fire, crippled cargo ships, as well as leaking oil tankers, from as far afield as Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, South Atlantic, a pirated ship off the coast of Yemen, as well as a sunken oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Nick is world-renowned for leading his team in the successful salvage of the Costa Concordia after it ran aground off the coast of Italy 2000? Was it? 2012. 12, sorry, I've got 13. He received the call to take on the Costa Concordia salvage work while he was working off the coast of New Zealand. And the rest, as they say, is history, because with his extraordinary team, the ship was salvaged. In 2015, he was awarded the German Sea Prize for this salvage action. At the 26th of October 2018 AGM of International Salvage Unions in Cape Town, the Society of Master Mariners of, Cape of South Africa awarded him a unique gold medal in recognition of his outstanding contribution to salvage operations worldwide. And so now I will hand you over to Nick, who will lead you through his outstanding adventure with and on the Costa Concordia. I think it's back. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I'll just tie this up quickly. Okay, can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be, to be here in Cape Town and uh, an honor to address the summer school series. I wasn't sure whether it was a joke when I got the initial invitation to come and lecture uh, present the uh, presentation because I was never really an academic at school, so I was never asked to stand up in front of the class unless I was in trouble. So, <laughs> um, the Casa Concordia was quite a unique uh, salvage operation and due to her, her size gave us a lot of challenges and also to all of the other contractors that were tendering for the operation around the world. Uh, we called it the, the uh, Power Buckle Project uh, power buckling is the actual terminology used by mariners to actually right the ship. Um, it comes from the old days of sail, where they used to use this mechanical advantage to get barrels of whiskey or liquid over the bulwarks, and if they ran aground on their voyages of, of the uh, voyages of adventure, uh, if they ran aground, they would actually hang them out off the booms and try and tilt the ship back off and uh, try and right themselves. Um, the largest power buckling operation in history was after the second, in the Second World War when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, that's where the whole fleet was um, sunk. Uh, here you've got the, uh, this one's the Oklahoma, and it actually took three years to power buckle the Oklahoma. Uh, so about the same time it took us for the Concordia. But with the Oklahoma, it's a warship, a very low center of gravity, extremely strong structural strength to uh, repel uh, incoming shells. And even though it was in a relatively shallow bay, uh, power buckling is not always successful. The Alaska and the, uh, the Utah are still there in Pearl Harbor as, as memorials. If you look at the Costa Concordia, um, all of the strength is from the keel below the water up until the lifeboat deck. So everything above the lifeboat deck has absolutely no strength. So you're going to have all of the, the forces that we're going to exert are below the lifeboats. And everything above it is large open spaces to try and maximize the space for passengers and uh, increase the size for theaters and the uh, enjoyment. 
So what actually happened, Friday the 13th, 2012, never go to sea on Friday the 13th, especially, <laughs> especially on a cruise ship. Uh, so they left to Visa Vecchia, which is the, the main port that services Rome, and they were bound up to near the Italian border to, uh, to Savona. And uh, while they were passing this coast during dinner, they deviated to show some guests and the passengers the island of Giglio. Uh, they hit an uncharted rock called Lescola. Not many uncharted rocks have names, but according to the captain, this one was not there. Um, they drifted. They, they hit the rock here, and they drifted way past the island just with their momentum. Uh, if you think this ship is three football or rugby fields long, 114,000 tons. Um, so when they were doing maximum speed, uh, they drifted way past the island. And very fortunately for them, the weather was actually quite calm. And they drifted slowly back until they actually landed on these two reefs. They were very fortunate that they landed on the reefs, otherwise they would have gone upside down and there would have been thousands of passengers. So this was the first photograph that the island took so when she went past the island, all, she had lost her engines within two minutes, so she actually glided past the island. And then one of the small, uh, this is a small fishing and, and ferry harbour, and now you've got three football lengths of ship trying to come into your port. So at about this stage, um, they started, you know, they're on the rocks, and they're starting to roll over. And it was about this stage that the captain actually left the ship. He never told that, he never had a mayday. He never told the Coast Guard where he was. So this was the first photograph taken by the helicopters searching for the ship. They didn't even know that the ship was actually on the rocks. And, he, and it was absolutely 90 degrees at this stage. And passengers were actually climbing down the side of the ship. Uh, 32 people died. And by the next morning, the weight of the ship had actually crashed her around the reef. And very fortuitously, there were two reefs. This one over here comes from the the island and it's just behind the, the bridge and the communication center and the other one's underneath the funnel. So it was actually about a hundred meters apart, these two reefs. Now if you tried to balance that ship on those two reefs, she was less than five meters from being perfectly well balanced. And uh, without being on those two rocks, thousands of people would, would have uh, been lost. So certainly divine intervention placed her on those rocks. Um, because it's a crime scene, uh, people died. It became uh, under the jurisdiction of the state prosecutor of Tuscany. The uh, region was called Grosseto. So they actually cordoned off the whole island. Uh, there was a search and rescue operation for the uh, 32 passengers that were missing. And uh, it, a crime scene, no one was allowed on board. So then they went out to tender and they asked, we want to remove the ship in one piece. Uh, I was part of an American and Italian joint venture. The Italians knew all about the Costa Concordia, but the Americans weren't too sure. So we had to tell them how big it is. So that's a Boeing, that's a Statue of Liberty, that's a Chicago train. And then we had a lot of rednecks on the team, so we have a Hummer. <laughs> <laughs> if you put it upright in New York City, so, you know, as I say, as big as the tallest buildings, now, if you compare her to the, the Titanic, which actually sunk 100 years before, 1912, so the modern ships today are incredibly high. But what is scary is that they both have the same draft. So the same, the same draft, about eight and a half meters, is under the water. But because of modern technology, engineering capabilities, computer design, they can actually build this whole space and over here, there's no structural strength above it. So all the strength is in the lower part of these ships. But it's quite scary how uh, technology has advanced and the size of the ships. And the largest ships now have over 8,000 people. So obviously, because we weren't allowed on the island, um, and shipping is quite a competitive, especially cruise market shipping, so they wouldn't give us the drawings from the, uh, from the shipyard where she was built. So you had to make a lot of assumptions. There were three different charts of the island, all showing different shapes of the rocks. So we had to make assumptions on where she was sitting on the reef, how far the reef was actually penetrating into the ship. 
Now assumptions are not great for engineers, but you have to use them. Uh, so the size of the ship and her location was the biggest challenge. So between those two reefs, there was a big valley of a whole rugby field. So between the rugby posts of Newlands or the soccer posts, there was this valley that you had to fill up to support the belly of the ship. So of course we make assumptions. Um, we got a team together. We're going to hold her onto the coast because she was sitting on these reefs over here. And if she fell off the reef, she was going into very deep water. So we had to hold her in position before we could actually get into uh, do work on the ship. This is the valley. So this is the one reef. And this is the second reef. Sorry, here. And uh, this is 100 meters. So we have to fill up that whole valley with, sea, uh, with, with uh, cement grout bags. Then we're going to drill into the seabed next to those, and we're going to put subsea platforms in. And those platforms, all three of them would be the same size as Newlands. And they're going to slip into these holes that we're going to drill. And these are the platforms they're used in the offshore industry. Uh, we're going to profile the legs to take the profile of the seabed. And then on the end here, we're going to have some pulling arms. So we're going to pull from the top of the ship all the way to the end of the platform and roll her upright onto the platforms. So we're going to install these on the subsea holes that we've drilled. So now you're at minus 60 meters of water to the surface. And once you've got all these platforms, we're going to add external buoyancy, uh, mainly because the ship itself, with that very light structure, there were no tanks. So we had to recreate all of the buoyancy that she had lost. And uh, these are 11-story buildings in height. And we can only weld them from the turn of the keel up to the lifeboat deck. So that's the only place that we can weld it because there's no structural strength on the ship to support all of this. So this is going to be a cantilever. But they're very large, so it's got a 10 meter by 11 meter base. And it's about 3,500 cubic meters of buoyancy per tank. So these we're going to weld all the way along on the upper side, the port side. But on the lower side, we still weren't sure what was going to happen. So the actual process of power buckling is to rotate the ship. So these are the buoyancy tanks. And we're going to pull from the buoyancy tank all the way to the outside of the platform and rotate the ship around this point here. And that point there is called the turn of the bilge. It's not a very strong, well, it's a strong structural part of the ship, but it's not strong enough to support the ship through this operation. So everyone said this is going to collapse. As it happened, uh, that's what our concept was, and then we won the contract. Um, there were 17 people on the team when we won the contract, and that night seven people resigned. They said, this is crazy. <laughs> so it was a bit nerve-wracking to say, well, what are we actually doing? And we hadn't been on board. So when we actually stood on board on the 22nd of May, uh, it was quite terrifying. But in that uh, process, we had 12 weeks to engineer the concept. And we had over 200 engineering documents that we had to take all of those concepts and break them down and get them to an engineering point where we could actually tender for the shipyards to make the, the buoyancy tanks, uh, find uh, the drilling companies to actually drill the holes, find the cement provider to find the cement. And at the same time, we could set up our company. Uh, and that meant that we had to build teams for each part of the operation. At, while we were doing this, we were doing an environmental baseline survey. So this is where the ship was, over here. And this is, was declared dead, this, this little block. So all of the seabed, the Posidonia grass, and any of the uh, micro-ecosystem uh, around there was declared dead. But we had to sample and do a baseline survey around the island and make sure that we didn't contaminate anything else. The island of Gilio makes uh, about 80% of its annual revenue in six weeks, uh, last two weeks of July and the month of August. So that was paramount. We weren't allowed to take their uh, tourism away. This is underneath the ship in the valley. Uh, this is a Posidonia seagrass. And everyone knew that that would die because of the shadow. They need the sunlight. But we found these giant clams. Um, they grow vertically out the seed. And they're about a meter long. Very tasty. We put some on the bra. 
Uh, they got a beautiful mother of pearl inlay, and while we were sunning the mother of pearl inlay on the balconies, and the Coast Guard and the police came, we found out they're endangered species we're not allowed to cook, and we had to transplant them. So we got the University of Rome Sapienza Department of Marine Biology, and they're still there today, and they had to transplant all of these outside that location, and they'll relocate them back maybe in the next year or two. Uh, they have promised us we'll be invited back to try and sample them and make sure they're still fit for human consumption. <laughs> so during this process, we know that the ship is lying on these two reefs, but she's actually molding herself around the reef. So just her pure weight, and everything's waterlogged, so we had another 400,000 tons of water inside. Uh, we built a finite element model. It's a computer-generated model and they can um, see what's going to happen to the structural part of the ship. So over here we had one million points of, of structural reference. It's the most uh, powerful and largest computer model ever made. And then we'd superimpose the three large platforms and all the cement, and then we'd actually rotate the computer model and see what happened. But it took 42 weeks for the program to run to give us an answer. Unfortunately, the answer wasn't what we wanted, because this is going. This is where the reef is, and they said that the uh, this is a bow section, the front of the ship, and they had the ship's theatre just inside over here. So all of the strength of the ship is on the outside. So you've got three stories and massive volume for the ship's theatre, and now you've lost the whole of the starboard side or the right hand strength around here. And then this is the back of the ship by the engine room. So on the one side you had the initial damage when she hit the rocks and now she's on the starboard side and she's lost all of this strength. And remember the strength of the ship is from the keel up to the lifeboat deck. So this is where we were really concerned and they said that the bow will fall off and the stern will fall off. So we had to change the plan. Uh, here on the stern section we added more cement and we profiled the cement to support her and we added three more baby platforms. So that would support the stern section all the way through the rotation or the power buckle. Unfortunately, on the bow section, it went over a cliff, so we didn't know what to do with that. So we said, well, let's carry on with what we do know, and then we'll think about that as we go along. So if you look at that type of damage, this is a 3D model of the damage. And again, all the strength is from the keel up to the lifeboat deck. So you've lost a lot of strength, the same in the engine room. Uh, we weren't allowed to show the authorities these drawings because the client got very upset when he saw them. Um, it doesn't look good, and the authorities were nervous enough without us showing them more graphics. So at this, while we were going through this uh, 12 weeks, we set up seven teams. Uh, four operational teams would be on Gilio itself. Uh, then we had the uh, planning and logistics, engineering, fabrication and construction, and finance and commercial. Uh, the type of contract we were on was a day rate, so we had to have a spreadsheet for every cost every day, and that had to be approved, and then 48 days later we hoped to get the money. But we had to uh, coordinate all of this to make sure we got the right components. Uh, we divided Italy into three regions. Uh, we had five shipyards, seven fabrication facilities, and 150 subcontractors. So the northwest, that was from Trieste all the way down to Ravenna. Uh, the southern part was from Sicily to Naples. And then from Giglio, where we were, Rome, all the way up to Genoa. So you had to make sure that every shipyard was doing exactly the same um, dimensional control on their expertise of what they were fabricating. One of the challenges was that the people in uh, Naples and Sicily do not believe that the people from Trieste are Italians and vice versa. <laughs> they actually speak a different dialect, they don't understand each other. So, so every weekend we'd get back on the island. Saturday was for logistics and Sunday was finance. And we had to sign off the weekly cost sheets. But with all that damage that we found out, now we know that when we do roll it upright, we won't be able to weld on the starboard side. The starboard side, the lower side, is going to be so badly damaged that we're going to put chains underneath here. So we'll put chains all the way underneath the ship. So as you roll up on top of the chains, and then we'll sink buoyancy tanks down, shackle them onto the chains, and then there'll be 56 chains along the length of the ship, and we'll pick her up in our harness. 
almost like a, life, a very large life jacket with buoyancy tanks on both sides. So here's the cement that we're going to support her. Here are the platforms. And then this is the pulling arm. So we're going to pull from here all the way to there. And then underneath the buoyancy tank, we have the chains. And then we hold her in position with the chains. So you're actually pulling underneath her and on top at the same time to actually power buckle her. At the same time, we found out that there was a blog by Anders Borkman. He's a Scandinavian naval, en naval engineer and naval architecture. I don't think he gets much sunshine. He's a very pessimistic guy. And he said that the blog was called Why the Costa Concordia Cannot Be Power Buckled. And he had all of these calculations, and he said this is the weak part of the ship, this point of rotation, and that the ship will, f you know, it's not strong enough, uh, the ship will fail. Now, of course, this was in the public domain. I had engineering teams from all over the world trying to uh, aid, but he said it's going to break apart, and actually we're wasting money. We may as well stop now. So now, of course, we're on site. Uh, the island itself is uh, volcanic, so there's no open sports fields where you can lay anything down. So you come, everything has to come from the mainland directly to the location. And uh, the only people we could put into the harbour would be people on the ferries. So everything else came uh, independent from the, the harbour that's over here. Uh, we had four teams, as I say, the inshore team. Uh, they would hold, they would prepare to hold the ship in position. So they had to drill into the rock uh, just next to the ship and actually put what we call holdback anchors. Uh, team number two, that would be those, the big dive team, and that would be underneath the, ba the belly of the ship. Uh, they would be filling up all those bags of cement with the cement grout. Team number three would be on the Concordia, and they were going to strengthen the ship to be able to take all the weight. And then team number four, that's the um, large diameter drilling team, that's to actually drill into the seabed at minus 60 meters and prepare the ship for those big platforms to arrive. And that's one that gave us a, well, they all gave us a problem, but the drilling into granite uh, gave us a lot of problems. So this is the belly of the ship. Um, so the divers would be up here, they would swim down and they'd actually start their work here. So it's actually quite a long swim before they actually start their work. Uh, here you can see the type of overburden before we need to drill. So we've got to drill into here. These are the holdback anchors, and the holdbacks will go all the way around and help the ship stay in position while the divers do their work. So the holdback, this is granite, the whole island, and uh, granite is your worst rock for drilling into, but once you're in this, it's perfect. But because of all these different layers, we have to drill into the bedrock. So we have to cut away here to put the anchors. And then once the anchors are in position, we have to drill down into the bedrock with micropower. So it's almost like going to your dentist for a crown or a new tooth, and he's going to put implants in. These are the implants. Team number two, so this is the uh, liverboard accommodation vessel. So 120 divers on board here. And then our supply vessel would come back from the mainland every three days. So every three days, it bring food, welding material, steel, everything we needed. We had to be 100% self-sufficient. The island could not feed us. Now, this is the offshore side, and here you actually see the rock. So the rock started hitting here, and it sliced all the way through, and it went through three watertight bulkheads. So that meant that five compartments were breached, and that's why she actually didn't survive. But that rock is another 12 meters inside the engine room and, and weighed 96 tons. Really big rock. This is team number four. Uh, that's a large offshore drilling diameter. So if you think of a drill, this actual drill bit is two meters in diameter. Here we go back inshore. Uh, these are the inshore holdback anchors. So here they've been tied into the bedrock and then these are the wires that go underneath the belly. And to tighten them, we're going to put towers on top of them, and the towers will have uh, hydraulic pulling machines to actually tension everything. Now, one of the things we, we don't know, I mean, we're seafarers, so we're not geologists, but uh, this is what you're after when you're doing core samples, and not that. 
So with the geology of the island, we found out there was great um, uh, granite, and then there was sort of semi-weathered, and then complete weathered. You had cavities and inclusions. So we had to get the geologists to come and explain to us the, you know, what we're doing. So this is where we were hoping to drill to hold the ship in position. And then this is the drilling area for the large platforms. But the geological setting of the island, you had these two main faults that came down the island itself. So they came down the mountain straight underneath the seabed and they interfered with the drilling operation. But then there were secondary faults that came at an angle and they impacted again. So every time we had these faults, we had to fill them up with cement and then start drilling again. So of course the client was getting a bit disappointed with all the delays. Um, then you had historical debris and, and granite blocks that have fallen down the mountain over the last thousand years. So this is the uh, island itself and this is where the ship is. But with the bureaucracy, as it was a crime scene, everything that we touched, we had to get permission from the prosecutor. And it took four months to get permission to cut the funnel off so that we could actually fit in here. And at the end, they said, you can cut the funnel off on one condition, that you put it back afterwards. <laughs> so we, we had to hire a warehouse in uh, Piambino on the mainland, and these had to be cut off in sections and reassembled so they could actually come and see what part of the funnel caused the accident. But yeah, this is the inshore operation. Uh, we call it the uh, landscaping team. Environmentally, it sounds much better to landscape the rock than to break the rock. So we did a lot of landscaping. We modified these, um, the, these machines that we hired, and then we put these teeth on as well. So this is almost like when the dentist said, it's not going to hurt. We were trying to tell the environment, the mentalists said, well, the island won't feel it. But everything had to be lined up with divers because we needed to be um, extremely accurate. So the divers would go down and, and set a template on the seabed. Um, and this is, you can see all of the rocks that we had to move out the way first before we can actually get into the bedrock. So now he's cutting away, he's chipping all the way into the cliff and then he'll bring the milling machine and that will grind it nice and smooth and then we can lay the anchor blocks. Now these are the anchor blocks, the whole back anchors. Uh, very large structures, they weigh 35 tons each. It's uh, three and a half meters in height, four meters in length and two meters wide. And uh, that's gonna take a thousand tons of, of pulling force on each. So here we're putting them in place. Now they're all on the seabed. They all lined up, so we had these underwater survey equipments and we had to make sure that the pitch and the roll of the anchor block was less than two degrees. So it wasn't allowed to be lying on its side. Um, and here you can see the micro holes and each one has 10 of them. And now they're in position, we'll come and drill through the holes and do the implant into the bedrock. So this is a micro pile team. Uh, this is the landscaping team and the micro pile team. But you had to maneuver around the reef and follow each other from from the south all the way to the north, or from the bow section to the stern section. These are micro piles. Uh, they come in eight meter sections. And we had to have 12 meters of good holding capacity before we could actually verify that we had the holding capacity. So if we had bad rock or inclusions, uh, then we used to have 16 meters or even 24 meters of micro pile to, to hold the holding power. Um, this is a micro pile that we've done for a test and uh, once you're in the granite, the holding capacity is extremely good. We needed 100 tons and we had 270 tons of holding capacity. I so say these are the towers. So each of these anchor blocks will get a tower on top of it. And on top of the tower, you've got the pulling machine. So these are called strand jacks, hydraulic pulling machines. They're actually gonna pull all the way down around the anchor block and into the belly of the ship. And each one of these blue machines has 500 tons of pulling capacity. So it's a large pulling capacity, uh, and we needed 12,000 tons of holdback capacity to hold it in position. So this is uh, in um, La Spezia. So obviously we had a, a derelict um, container berth, and we lined them all up until we were ready on location. 
and then we brought them out by barge and installed them on top of the anchor block. So each one of these is on top of an anchor block. And then the wires will come around here and underneath the belly of the ship, and they can hold the ship in position. But also during the rotation, we can increase the pulling capacity. So now we have team number two. These are the divers who are going to do the cement grout. And that's the finish that we were holding, uh, hoping for. So the better the finish, the more the forces are dissipated or spread along the length of the ship. So we've got to finish this as perfectly as possible. And these are called the mattresses. And all of the other ones are just the, the different types. And they're held in place with the platform. So the platforms will have a bumper that will hold the cement in place. This is the uh, cement team. So we could produce 600 cubic meters of cement at a batch. So the divers would go down on the seabed, lay out all the cement bags, and then pump them full from the surface, and uh, then do the next layer. So this was the plan. This is, this is where the large platforms are, the large, three large platforms. And then this is the cement bags. And then this is the additional bags to hold the stern and stop the stern, the back of the ship breaking off. So this is the same size as Newlands rugby field over here. So if you can imagine building a wall of cement bags, each one the size of a swimming pool, from the rugby posts or goal posts, it's a lot of cement. Each bag had to have a, a, a design capability. We'd been told, because no one wanted to verify what we were doing, we had to comply with the uh, Italian code of offshore structures. And the introduction said you must submit your drawings at least three years before you start. So we were catching up quickly. Um, as I say, each one of these bags is the size of a swimming pool, between 50 and 90,000 liters per bag. And you're stacking them up, and uh, that's going to fill up the whole void space and then support the belly of the ship and stop the belly collapsing, and then also spread the load. So here you can see that the, these are the platforms with the bumpers. This is all the cement. And right on the top here, we've got what we call the Kit Kat bags. So these are cement bags, uh, but that's where the chain. So each one of these will have a, a large chain running through it. And the ship can roll over the chain without the chain cutting in the ship because it will go inside the bag. They're called Kit Kat bags because the manufacturers or the, could not understand our drawing. So we took a picture of a Kit Kat with sand in between the little chocolate blocks. <laughs> so now the Italian code of offshore structures Kit Kat bags are certified. But here you can see the ship's resting on this reef and that reef. And now we're going to spread the load and we're going to support her belly. The chain's going to run through here, and then she'll roll onto the platforms. And this is at the, at the stern of the ship, at the back of the ship. You can see the profile, and that's going to hold the ship all the way through the rotation. So she's going to roll around this, and then the keel will come onto these baby platforms. And that should stop the, the back of the ship falling off. But if you look at the profile, I mean, there's quite a steep uh, angle of rock. And you've got to drill vertically into it, but not only drill vertically, but you've got to be 100% accurate that all four legs or six legs of the platform fits in. There's no point if one of the legs was out of position. You'd look a bit silly. So this is where we lost a lot of time, was trying to drill from the surface all the way down to minus 60 meters. So now we've got team number three. These are the team that's going to strengthen the ship. They've taken away all the paint. So these represent the internal frames or ribs of the ship. And we're going to strengthen that part of the ship. And we're going to add these big plates. And this is where the chains will be shackled onto. And then you need welders. So of course, the ship's at 24, 25 degrees. No welders in the shipyard work at 24, 25 degrees. We did try to find a lot of people with one leg shorter than the other. <laughs> but, uh, so we also had to comply with the uh, welding procedures. Now, there was no welding procedure for this type of work. So we had to develop a welding procedure and have it authorized. And it got authorized finally after we finished the job. <laughs> but all of the welders had to do a mountain climbing course because they had to strap themselves in. So we had the Dolomisi Rocky uh, from the Dolomite Mount Mountaineers. And they would actually do the training. But they'd also be there 24 hours a day 
to make sure that people didn't take off their harness. And then these plates are going to spread the load around the turn of the bilge. So the part of the bilge that was in contact with the rock was about the size of the table in front of you. And that wouldn't be strong enough. So now we've got 11 meters by one and a half meters, and it's profiled to go all the way around the, the turn of the bilge or the, the, the bottom of the ship, and that's going to spread the force, and that will help sub, uh, the turn of the bilge survive. So each, each particular frame had a slightly different uh, shape because of the profile of the cruise ship. So again, you can see the welders. Now, you know, welders sometimes don't like to be tied on, so sometimes they take it off. But when they fell in the water, you'd leave them there for a while and let them reflect <laughs> of why, why they were being held on in the first place. And then as you get towards the bow section, the profile of the ship you know, changes. So we had a different section of the ship, and these were for the young welders. So anyone under 20, 18 or 25 you could weld, they do this type of welding. Then underneath the ship, we've got to make sure that we strengthen that same turn of the bilge and that the chains go exactly through the middle of that plate. So we built uh, what these called are, so this is a plate, and this is a bell mouth, and the chain's going to run through there. And when she rolls, that, uh, the, the guide is very light steel, and that will collapse, and then the, the main 44 millimeter steel will spread the load. But of course, you've got 56 chains, you need 56 containers. These chains don't come from the hardware store. We had to have it specially manufactured. Um, quite heavy links. So one length of chain is between 28 and 30 tons. So that's one chain. Uh, when we came to install it, we tell the divers, don't make your problem my problem. Just get on and do it. But here you can see, so the chain is going to be connected up here before the buoyancy tank comes and then goes all the way underneath. This is the... Uh, the KitKat bags, and then through the bell mouth, and then connected to the inshore towers. So here you can see the chain. But if we had the chains fitted through that, and then we finished the cement grouting, we knew that the chain was exactly in the middle of those plates. So that was actually quite a nice achievement. So large diameter drilling. We went to tender internationally. We only had three companies who said that they could do this. Uh, one came from Italy, and he asked one question. He said, how big is the drill bit? And we said, no, two meters in diameter. And he said, are we drilling in sandstone, limestone, or granite? And we said, no, it's granite, and it's got an MPA, a hardness of about 105 to 120. And uh, he actually swore at us and said, we must be freaking crazy. And he's not interested. So he said, well, you could have called us on the phone. No, he said he wanted to come and have a look at the ship anyway. <laughs> so not being a driller, we took him out for dinner and we asked him all the questions why it can't be done. And he said that he's lost uh, money twice with his company and it's always been with granite. So that was a bit of a concern. This is the drill head and then the, the drill bit itself. So it's got a diameter of two meters and it weighs 74 tons. And all of these are sacrificial tungsten carbide teeth on the rollers, and it just goes round and round and mills into the bedrock. But of course, I got this out of Drilling for Dummies, because I bought a book, Drilling for Dummies. And it's all nice and flat, and there's no rocks. So we knew what they were talking about when they said casings and drill heads, but it didn't really help us. And of course, due to the environmentally sensitive uh, area, all of the, what they call the cuttings, had to be sucked up like a vacuum cleaner and then separated on the surface. You couldn't just let it drift off in, in, the, uh, in the marine environment. So these are the casings that we had to have, and the drill bit will go through the middle, but we had to have different shapes and sizes because of the profile of the seabed. So now we've got the whole kit assembled. This is the actual drill operation, and all of these compressors, generators, shakers is all to support this operation and that's about the same size as a rugby field or football field as well and that's the drilling operation so it's independent of the work platform so that the vessel can move around and then this goes into the bedrock of course if you drill into your bathroom mirror you want to drill in 90 degrees for your mirror 
otherwise your draw bit slides. So if you hold it 35 degrees or 40 degrees, it's going to slide all the way down the mirror. So we're drilling from the surface onto the bedrock at 35, 40 degrees, and the drill bit was kicking away from the island. So we had to build these subsea templates. So each one of these represents the sockets or the sleeves for the platform. And these are the hydraulic legs, and we could adjust the legs. So the idea was we keep these uh, within half a degree of vertical, then the, the legs should fit. So that weighed 284 tons. Uh, again, was another addition to the, the, the cost factor. One of the things that the island were worried about, not only the turbidity or the cuttings, but the noise and vibration. And every time we started the drill, then the tuna would come. Now, the tuna don't normally come to this part of the island. So these are two meter plus, you know, that's two meters, so this is more than two meters. And they'd come and rub themselves up on the... Uh, so we tried a couple on the bright to make sure you know, that they weren't sort of traumatized, but they were fine. <laughs> we actually shared that with the Coast Guard and the uh, Cabinary as well. But here are the platforms, and these are the bumpers on the front. So each one of these, three of these together is the size of, of a rugby field or soccer field. And they weigh about 1,000 tons. And then we had to profile the bumper to take the, the profile of the seabed. And that's going to hold the cement in place while you rotate the ship. So, come to April of 2013, it's a year after, more than a year, and it's the first time anyone could see anything happening. All the other people said we've been doing nothing for months. It looked exactly the same, apart from some preparation work. But all the preparation work was underneath, and then these came and uh, we installed the, the seabed. So this is a, called an ROV, an underwater camera. And you can see it watching another ROV, and then the legs going into the sockets. So the fact that all six legs were actually fitted in uh, meant that the platforms were perfect. You can see it going down. So that was a, an important milestone that they actually fitted. So it gave us some confidence that we were doing the right thing and we could have another braai and celebrate. <laughs> so life on the Concordia, um, yeah, so now we've got a team of about 530 people working day and night. So we've got teams from midnight to midday, seven in the morning to seven at night, and they're all overlapping. And uh, this was the actual lifeboat deck over here but now she's on her side, so we had to make a false deck. And this was the only place before the power buckle that you could actually stand up on the ship. Every other time you had to be strapped in and holding on. So th this is the main thoroughfare. It's a lifeboat deck, runs all the way up, uh, 270 meters long. You couldn't see the other side. But it's where you could come up, have your tea, coffee, sandwiches, lunch. Uh, we could use the, the actual the floor of the of the deck for keeping things ship shape. We built workshops every 80 meters so that we had spares exactly where we needed them. And the welding stations, we had three welding stations. Each welding station had six kilometers of uh, welding cable. So again, the client didn't believe us that we needed that much. And uh, everything had to be under the Italian code of offshore structures, so we had some Italian safety officers. Good guys, we told them what to do. <laughs> so, the island itself is, uh, since the time of Nero, being used by the Romans for their summer holidays. So, environmentally, the waters were pristine, a lot of coral, fishing, good, and hiking. So, we had to put these oil booms around, even though there was no remaining oils. Um, the Coast Guard said, you have to look as if we're protecting the island. And we did such a good job that when the weather got bad, they wouldn't allow us to remove the oil beams. So we lost six kilometers of oil beam every storm. Now this was uh, the first storm that really caused us a lot of chaos in November. Um, they told us originally, don't worry about the weather. Well, you, you can see the power of these waves. It's called a Sirocco. It comes all the way up from Sicily with a little bit of Sicilian vengeance. And the ship itself collapsed two meters that night. 
So all the alarms were going off, people were phoning us, what's happening, we had no idea. But we think that where, where she collapsed was on the, on the balconies. All the balconies were about two metres wide, and the balconies on the, on the lower side all collapsed around the rocks. But fortunately, she didn't break. So we had to just trim the platform legs another two metres because she was deeper. We also had water spouts, but they said you don't get water spouts in, in winter, so we're not sure what they are. But they, they look like water spouts. So here you've got, uh, this is um, La Scola rock. It's a part of the, the remaining part of the rock that they hit. Beautiful corals, and it is the number one dive site in the Tyrrhenian Sea. So the fact it's got a name and it's on a chart and the divers know about it, it's a pity uh, Scatina didn't know. It's also got the best octopus I've ever tasted. So uh, if you ever go to Gilio, the octopus is famous. Now these are the buoyancy tanks, the, the sponsons. They've been fabricated at five shipyards around Italy. Um, as I said, uh, they, they're extremely strong structures. They're going to be taking compressed air to blow out all of the water once they're underneath. That's just the, the size. I said they're 11 stories in height and really strong. It takes what they call two bar over ambient pressure, which for a big tank is quite dangerous. Um, but when they were ready around Italy, we'd put them on a barge and bring them to Livorno. Livorno was our staging post. So here you can see them arriving. We put them in the container uh, storage area and then we had to rotate them and then add on this bit. And this is the only part that's going to be welded to the ship. So that's near the, the turn or the bottom of the ship. And then these are these big plates that uh, the chains hold on to. So what we'd do is we'd actually go and um, scan the side of the ship where the frames are going to go. And we'd come and actually trim, it's called the grillage, to fit the profile of that particular part of the ship. Uh, we had a company from Aberdeen called um, MIT, and they did the laser scanning of the hull. And that actually meant that the tolerances for the welders was much less, 10 millimeters of welding. But they're large structures, they only just fitted into the ship. Uh, now we fitted the platform, so now we're into June, June the 10th, and we're doing a test fit because we had no permission, because we still didn't comply with any regulations. So we were told we're not allowed to do it, and we said we've got to test it. Uh, it works so well, we left it there. <laughs> but that's one big tank, you know, so. Uh, we did another test fit two days later for the one next to it. And then they got, yeah, they, they were starting to smell a rat. <laughs> but that one fitted well. But you can see the gap between is only 38 millimeters, less than two inches. So the tolerances were really not what you want in salvage industry. And then this is a grillage, so the welders will go inside and then spend a couple of weeks. But um, another excuse for a bride. <laughs> but if you had to do this, and leave it over the next winter. Then the winter weather would get underneath and blow it apart. So when we did that, we actually forced them and we'd gone past the points and they returned. So we couldn't wait for permission. We just said, now we go without permission. Um, this was a control room that we used, and here we got all of the others. But we still had the bow section, so by now we've come up with an idea. Uh, between Christmas and New Year 2012-13, we had a small team that we weren't allowed to go anywhere until we came up with a plan. So we're going to take out the three bow thrusters and we're going to replace them with these pipes. And then we're going to bring in what they call a neck brace or the twisted sisters. So every patient that was taken off the, uh, off the Concordia to the uh, medic base ashore, we'd have them in a stretcher and we'd put a neck brace. And the neck brace looked like that. And the one day we were looking at the neck brace and we said we need a neck brace for the, for the bow section with buoyancy tanks. And then we'd sink this down and then bounce it off the rocks but wrap it around those three pipes. And it would fit the profile. And once you pump out the water then it actually sucks on with the shape of the uh, flare of the bow. And that actually gave us five and a half thousand cubic meters of buoyancy. So when we put that through the computer program, it actually said the whole front of the ship will survive. Uh, we told it to our, our clients uh, on the 4th of February, and on the 5th of February they told us it's strictly forbidden to proceed with this crazy idea. 
but we ordered the steel anyway. <laughs> we said there's no point in power buckling three quarters of the ship. You know, if, we don't, if we leave the bow behind, we may as well, we'll be locked up anyway. But they're very large pipes. Uh, again, 290. Uh, there's only one foundry in Europe that could give us the steel. And then these are the Blister Sisters. Uh, this one, the right hand one, she came from Ancona on the Adriatic. And this one, the left hand one from Palermo. And then we married them together on the barge with hinges so that we could adjust the hinges with the buoyancy control system. So once we get there, we just got to get up and actually add in valves and controls so that we can control every little valve. But it's three dimensional, so when you have a bubble going through different pressures of the water, then the bubble changes shape and the buoyancy changes. So we had to know exactly the shape of the internal bubble. And as I say, this is a heavy lift ship. Uh, it weighed 1,500 tons of steel structure and gave us six and a half thousand tons. But she's going in the water. Um, we still, because we've been told we cannot go ahead, they said it's impossible to design, fabricate, deliver, and install in time. So they won't pay us until we installed it, because we didn't have an installation manual. Uh, so we, we put, put it in. This was our control room again. So we had all the underwater cameras, and all the winches were controlled from here. Uh, after 72 hours, five of the six pins had locked, and we could say she was home. And we generated an invoice for 10.3 million euros and said, it's done. But that actually saved the whole, that was a final component that we didn't know about. So now you've got the, the blister tanks around the bow, and we've got the midship section. So this is where all the forces are going to be done. This is over the damage, and this is where the reef is on the front and the reef at the back. So now we've got to, it's end of August, September, and we're running out of time to do it before October, November, bad weather. So we had a press release that we're gonna do it on Friday the 13th of September. <laughs> <laughs> so we got called to Rome and they said, listen, one thing's not gonna happen. It's Friday the 13th is out. So we asked for Saturday the 14th. They said, no, no, no one works on the weekend. It'll be Monday the 16th. And uh, they said, how long will it take? I said, we don't know. We've got no idea of the shape of the rock inside. And all of the calculations are based on assumptions. So we had six engineering teams working on, on the calculations with different assumptions. And we had an optimistic forecast and we had a pessimistic forecast. So we had to plan for the pessimistic and hope for the optimistic. But we didn't know whether the ship would take the pessimistic forces. So. Eventually, we get there Monday, the uh, 16th of September. Over that weekend, we pre-tensioned everything. So we took it up to about 25% of the required forces. And we could see from the accelerometers that we had that she was actually flexing with that type of force. And there was just one thing left to do. My wife insisted on coming to kiss her keel goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started uh, Monday morning. Um, of course, uh, well, what happened there? Okay, well, that was meant to be a, a video clip, but it didn't go off. So uh, these were the guys that were in the, in the, in the uh, control room with us. Obviously, uh, we'd been told the week before they took us to the local jail and they showed us our cells because we still had no permission. So there were 27 ordinances that we were breaching. And if we continued with the operation and she broke, then we were doing willful damage to the environment. So we were a little bit nervous. Um, when we started, of course, no one else had seen the damage or the three-dimensional drawing that we had had. So we started in the morning. It took quite a while. We went way past the optimistic forces. And actually, we went way past the pessimistic forces. And we had 50% reserve capacity. And we 